the nonprofit MBA purpose is to provide new business insights and fresh creative ideas for executive directors and their teams that will help them improve their organization. Here is your host, Stephen Halasny. Welcome, everyone. My name is Stephen Halastic. I will be your host, as I usually am, for today's Nonprofit MBA podcast. For those of you who don't know me, I am co-founder of Financing Solutions, and Financing Solutions is the leading provider of lines of credit for small nonprofits in the United States. Uh, yes, there is a company that provides lines of credit now for nonprofits. We've been doing it for 12 years. It's a very popular product. If you're interested in learning more about the line of credit, please visit our website at nonprofitmbapodcast.com. Again, that's nonprofitmbapodcast.com. We have a sponsor as well for today's podcast. It's Arrays. They're spelled A-R-A-I-Z-E. Arrays Fast Fun Online. They're really, really good software uh, for account, accounting software for small to medium sized nonprofits. I actually, I'm on the board of, of a couple of nonprofits and uh, one of the uh, nonprofits I'm on, we've moved to a raise as like most nonprofits, they, uh, we were using QuickBooks and we just, you know, just wasn't doing what we needed. It's great to have software that's specifically made for your industry. And that's what a raise is. And if you're interested in learning more, please go to their website at A-R-A-I-Z-E.com or call Joe at 866-840-7449. And today I'm very excited to be speaking again with AJ uh, Steinberg from Queen Bee Fundraising. Uh, uh, She has over 20 years in experience as a nonprofit event producer and engagement strategist, AJ Steinberg has worked on over 100 successful events and raised millions of dollars for organizations with her Los Angeles based production company. In 2015, AJ launched Queen Bee Fundraising to share the art of nonprofit event planning sponsorship acquisition and engagement strategies with organizations worldwide. She is a recognized topic expert and trainer and presents on subjects such as nonprofit event planning, event sponsorship, committee and volunteer leadership, generation giving and guests engagement. Um, Today, we're going to be talking about keys to running a successful fundraising event. And so AJ, welcome to today's uh, nonprofit MBA podcast. Well, thank you for having me, Stephen. So uh, in, in one word, what do you think the key to running a successful fundraising event is? Planning. Yeah. That's I had what to I was really think too. about one yeah, word. Yeah. I was going to say that. I was, I was like, a, oh, that's what I thought. So on the spot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No planning but, for sure. But may I just say planning, intention, intentional planning with an eye towards best practices. Yeah, so let's talk about that's that's a good lead way because I was going to go in that direction too. As far as best practices go, what are the best practices nowadays when it comes to uh, fundraising events? Oh, that's a big. So when we're yeah, yeah. So give about, me uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So give me dishes. like that's okay. Yeah, give me you know. I don't know if you've written a blog about it or you know a book or you know give me five right. of the top ones that you can think of. I'll tell you the seven because I have one that's the seven elements Good. of a successful event because this is what it takes and each element of course when you say how do we put on a successful fundraising event I say that's sort of like putting somebody in the cockpit of a jumbo jet and saying we're going to show you in an hour how to fly this you can't you obviously have to have experience but The first step is identifying well-defined goals, meaning if you don't know what you're trying to achieve, and it's not just raising money, these are great stewardship opportunities. The second step is to get your board on board and excited and engaged, and that's an art unto itself. The next is recruiting a rock star event committee, because you can't and shouldn't be doing this all by yourself. The next is attracting and engaging event sponsors, because that will monetize your event and give you long-term relationships with corporations for more sponsorship dollars. The next is a marketing plan. And that ties into your sponsorships because you need to 
let them know how you'll be marketing the event and their sponsorships. The sixth step is having an engagement strategy. People do not just show up and suddenly there's massive engagement. Uh, you need to craft it. And it is something you should spend a lot of time and thought on before the event happens. Mm -hmm. And lastly is keeping the momentum going post event. You want to make sure that you keep that love flowing. You know, you spend nine months putting together a gala and you know, I say it takes nine months to make a baby and nine months to make a gala. Well, if you put nine months and a hundred thousand dollars into an event, why would you just not stay in top of touch and keep the stewardship flowing after the event? Why would you let it die? And you'd be shocked how many great organizations just fall flat after their event and don't do proper follow-up. Yeah, I, I would tell you too. I mean, I went to my first huge gala event and I, I raised a lot of money. Um, and uh, I think they fell apart by, at the end, uh, by not thanking me for how much money I raised. Um, so yeah. I think, you know, it's really like they thought they, listen, they thought, well, somebody came up to me and thanked me at the place which was really, really nice. But, you know, and I raised uh, $12,000. And uh, so um, I, you know, I expected a call after, you know, honestly. And that's it. So my clients, I, in fact, if anybody listening wants this, I have a three-step protocol following the event of how you should thank each level of donor, each sponsor level. And it's very specific from if somebody has raised money, a phone call from a board member or the executive director is a must. And it should happen within two days of the event. An email should be going out to everybody and then a follow up two days after the event, then a follow up email. And I have very specific what's said in each telling the story of the impact that their donation and money raised made. And then four weeks later, another follow up thanking them and saying the love keeps flowing this is the impact that we're seeing and we can't yep. wait to see you at your next event. Keep them in the stewardship cycle. It is not bothering them to get a thank you. Plus, if you're a sponsor, all those leftover tribute book, the event booklets that are sitting on the seats after people leave, if you're an organization, you pick those up and anybody who sponsored or put an ad in, you send a hard copy of that tribute book that would have been tossed to them with a personal thank you note, maybe some photos. We even do frame photos for big donors to say, thank you for participating. We know you probably weren't here because the decision makers don't usually show up. We want you to see how amazing this event was. And your ad is on page 22. They can see their ad was there. They can see who else sponsored. They can see what happened at the event. And your tribute book tells the story of your organization as well as the event. It is your best marketing tool for saying thank you and for bringing on sponsors next year. So make sure you collect all those booklets and use them for marketing. So, so when you. you're brought on to help coach somebody to run these events, uh, let's say, I mean, certainly, and I've, I've told that one of the own, my own nonprofits that I belong to that, that we should definitely have a fundraising event. Um, and they, they're like in a perfect location for it. Um, so the, my question is when, when they're working closely with you, would you say it takes three years to really get it right, to system, systematize it all? Um, you know, I'm not saying that the first year is going to be bad. I'm sure it's going to be good. Is If you're coaching them, I'm sure that the first season is going to be really good. I'm, I'm positive. <laughs> the, you know, but I would also think – you by the time the third season goes around, because you have the you know the first year you you're building like let's use the I'll use the word methodology, right? You're building it. The second year maybe you refine it, you learn from that experience in your first year, and then the third year you start to really rock and roll with you know really in, increasing your goals. Is that 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 in, that intellectually would make sense? But if you work with Somebody like me, you're skipping straight to the methodology is there. Right from the, I agree. I get it. I literally, I just finished one where it was a disarray. It was a mess. They had already started the process. I'm not even going into details, but I came in and I showed them 
the reasons that I set my events up like this had a very specific. And they made $300,000 and have this whole cycle of stewardship that happened. Another example is a small organization that had a lot of bad will in the community. It was a regional YMCA because they had an unfinished capital campaign. They had $2 million left on it and it was a big hole in the ground. They decided to do an inaugural gala, never done it before. It's a YMCA. It's not like a Philharmonic and they wanted it at the Four Seasons. I was brought in, it was already in place, but because they chose that rock star committee, we helped identify the rock star event committee we chose what I call the golden goose honoree, meaning it's an honoree who's beloved, who's really invested in your organization, who will open what we used to call the Rolodex, you know, open the Rolodex for sponsorships and guests. And while they had a very ambitious $100,000 goal, by the time we were done doing, it was not left to chance. It was following my system. They made almost half a million dollars at the event because people were so amazed and they were so moved. Plus the honoree stepped up afterwards and fulfilled the $2 million and completed the capital campaign. And that still goes on. So that first one, believe it or not, if you have someone like me come in and do coaching or work with you step-by-step The amount of money you're going to raise and the goodwill you're going to build is phenomenal. But what happens is you need to keep it going. The second one, a little, you know, people are excited. They had a great time at the first one. They're buying tickets. Everybody's still engaged and excited. If you fall flat on that second one, the third one, believe it or not, is a real hard sell, Hmm. you know, because if you have to build, build, build. That stewardship cycle after an event. Event is one moment in time on a continuum. It's one moment. So all the work you do building up to the event is marketing your organization to your committee and your boards. You're getting enthusiasm. You're letting new people, guests are new people. They don't know you exist. When you hit the plateau of that event afterwards, you need to keep the engagement going. Do not fall down. And even my clients do, even though I on their butts and give them my protocols. Sometimes they just fall down. I call it thank you week, by the way. So the week following your gala or event is called thank you week. It's a week that nobody takes a vacation. Like oh, that's everyone a great thinks, idea. Oh. And we spend one week. That's focused great. On thank you and tying it up. And that's wow. what we call it. So I'm not joking to you is there's two things you should invest in. It's an event producer who has protocols like me, who has proven This is not just me feeling good. This is me saying this is what's going to engage and capture hearts, open hearts and wallets. Invest in a good event producer. And if you can't afford that, an event coach. And if you can't afford that, please get a day of event producer so that somebody else is running the event. So you can be out there with your donors and your supporters really making connections. But also your auctioneer is worth his weight in gold. Your MC oh, yeah. auctioneer. Yeah. There was nothing. So here's a terrible story. I'm sorry to give you bad stories, but I really worked close with my auctioneers for one month. We spent hours upon hours honing every point of messaging, every moment in the sequence of the event. So I had just had an event in May. It was an inaugural event. It was the one that was really successful, raised over $300,000. This was a very upscale crowd, hugely upscale. And we were given an auctioneer who was a partner of another auctioneer that I'd worked with that everybody wanted, but he wasn't available. I was a little nervous because I had never worked with this auctioneer and he showed up and first of all, he was deaf. I am not joking you. He walked by me and I said, hello, so-and-so. And And he just walked right by me. And I said to my partner, I said, do we have a deaf auctioneer? So he was deaf. He had this terrible tremble in his hand, and it was obvious he was ill. It was really obvious. He was an older gentleman. He got up and he blew everything. I mean, I kept getting up on stage, and because that's what I, you know, I've got to keep it moving. We left a lot of money on the table despite the success, and everybody's comment was that was a terrible auctioneer, you know. And my, this is this is just something we can't help. He's not a terrible auctioneer. He obviously has a medical issue that popped up. 
uh, I called his partner and I said, you can't send him out until you sit down with him and have a heart to heart about what physically is happening with him. Because he literally was trembling. He read instead of talking to the audience, he was reading it. So I can't take that back. You know, I, I take responsibility has nothing to do with me. They chose the auctioneer, but I take responsibility as like, oh my God, what am I going to do with this? Yeah. I mean, so I'm going to give you some insight from an outsider's perspective. I don't know if everybody's going to be like a duh. I've heard this before, but you know, the, when, when you're a donor, when you're, when you're someone who raises money for the organization because you believe in it, like I was, okay. Uh, you look at, this is your opportunity to see if this organization is organized and if they know what they're doing, because I'm not getting their, well, actually I did get the services. So of this organization that I, uh, that I, uh, uh, raised money for and donated for, I mean, really believed in it. And, um, but a lot of times your donors don't get to see, all they do is hear from you how great a job you're doing. Right. And believe me, most people, they want to not hear how good a job you're doing. They want to see how good a job you're doing. And when you're running these events, if it's really well organized and, uh, you know, I get you want to raise money, but if it's really well organized and everything runs like clockwork. And, you know, the crazy thing, too, is that people only remember the worst thing that happens at the event. Right. So the, like the worst and the best. Yeah, correct, yeah, like uh, like this the event I went to, and the lowlights. right? This event I went to was huge. All right, it was it raised seven hundred thousand dollars. It was the first time I have ever been to one. It the auctioneer was amazing. So you talk about the best thing I remember. It was the auctioneer, right? I was he was unbelievable, right? And and the worst thing I remember is the no thank you for me. And I was a for this committee. I was the lar largest fundraiser by far of everybody that was there. And so, uh, I mean, tw well, $12,000 was just, yeah, well, I did more than that, but uh, that was just donations. Not include That did not include what people bought at the event because I had a whole table, 12 people. So, you know, I'm really debating because now, like, I see, I'm like, ugh, I don't know. You know, this, are, are, they will run, are they well run here? You know, I just, I really question it and it's coming up in October again. And I'll be like, uh, I don't know if I'm going to do this thing again. So, so um, I would say you would do them a great service in calling their development I, person. I may, I probably will. I'll, I'll just wait for a time it comes up and I'll be interested to see if they actually call me and say, Mr. Holasnik, are you going to be involved again? Like you were last year. I'll say to them, I go, you know, I really don't know because you know, you know I don't listen. I'm not a petty person by far, you know? But, um, you know, the organization meant, and there's, you know, and I was, I was in the organization as far as, uh, getting benefits from it as well. It's a, it's a grief foundation because my wife died mm -hmm. and, uh, oh, it was nice. a grief foundation yeah. for me and my son. And, uh, and, you know, rather it was during COVID or not, they, there was a lot of room for improvement. And this is not a small organization. This is a, this is a, a $7 million nonprofit. So that's not that small, right? They um, should know better, especially yeah. as, is, uh, well, if it was me and I was the executive director and my development person had fallen down like that, I would appreciate a call just saying, listen, I was a recipient of you know, of your work. It was really meaningful in my family. I want to support you, but let me tell you why I'm hesitant and you're going to have to earn me back because I have to tell you is that this doesn't cost that organization a cent to say, thank you. You have a board. Every board member should be tasked with at least calling this many people. It's not so onerous if you break it up. And then what happens is that board may be getting what I call grumpy board syndrome. You know, you sit in the they don't want to help anymore because they may be experiencing that same lack of appreciation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you're and right. Yeah. This, I think if you really feel that there is value, because how many organizations want your time and your treasure? That's what I always say is there's a million of them that would jump on you joining forces with them. 
But if this was a really great organization and you feel that it's something that you would like other people to participate in, in terms of getting the counseling, you would be doing them such a huge service. You know, I always liken it to somebody who you never hear from that friend from a way back when until they want to move and you have a truck. So they want to borrow your truck. So they call you, they bring the truck back, got no gas in it. And then you don't hear from them again until two years when they move. You yeah. don't want to be that guy borrowing the truck, you know? Yeah, well, I, I've learned that, believe me. So I, I agree. Sorry. Not just I'm so sorry. sorry you had that experience. Well, because... you know, whatever. It's uh, it's And there's uh, there were other things that point to Well, issues. I will tell you this, too, is that you brought your friends in who made donations and bought things. You brought your friends and colleagues to that event. It's embarrassing to think that they didn't get thanked either. Oh. You know, it's... Oh, I wrote them a personal note. You hadn't note. thought of it. I wrote them a personal <laughs> note, though. I know, but it was know. such a great opportunity yeah. for the organization. And I, I know. Awesome. Yeah, and, and so that was easy for me to do because I let them know how you know wh- why this was so important. Um, right. Let's 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 so so I am listening <laughs> to my I'm I'm thinking like my listeners right now, and my listeners on this podcast are going to say, "I'm doing this. I'm doing that." I'm doing this, I'm doing that. And now you want me to run a major fundraising event. Like they're not saying that they're saying, I want to run a major fundraising event, but I, I'm so being torn in so many different directions. Yeah. What do we do about that? Well, a small organization. So obviously that means your listening base is small and medium organizations, which yay, you, yay, small and medium. They're the bread and butter of our world. The, you you need to, first of all, understand what's available to you in terms of assets and resources. And when I say assets and resources, your assets are your people and their connections. Meaning, can you really throw a gala at $350 a ticket if the people on your board and your support base can't afford that ticket price? So right there, that's going to downscale wow. you or you're going to say, Yes. I mean, this is the problem people get into. They don't understand why they can't sell tickets. They didn't build an event that will appeal to their base and their supporters and their donors and their wallets. There's, this is such a long conversation, but in terms of a small organization is that you need a really dedicated committee. And I have three words that are on my desk and in a frame, it's organization, communication, and depreciation. And those are the three things you need to think about every step of the way during event planning. So organization means have your protocols in place, have your timelines in place. And if you need something like that, you can email me. I'm sure that Stephen will give you, can I give my email if they sure. want it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's AJ, my name, AJ, at queenbeefundraising.com. And I have every timeline, every list, every protocol that you need. So being organized, meaning let this committee know that it's not that hard because you're organized. You have dates and timelines, tasks. So be organized to start out with will give you con- your team confidence that you all can do this without just like flying off the handle every two seconds. Communication is you need to let your committee know what they're supposed to do. You can't assume they know how to put on a gala. If you have these timelines and these protocols, share it with them and only have one committee meeting a month. You do not need a million committee meetings. Everybody doesn't need to be in a group group. And then appreciation. If you can be thankful and grateful to your committee, to your board, to your staff who's working hard and to the guests afterwards like you, that's going to make next year happen even easier. So when you say that they feel overwhelmed, it's just because they don't know the steps it takes to put on an event. It's not like, oh my God, we have to have a huge event. How are we going to do it? It's like, oh, here's a roadmap. We do this step first. We do this step next. We do this step next. So much easier for a staff that's not used to putting on events to follow and succeed when they do an event. And once again, choose the right event. I had one organization that was an international reef check organization that had uh, citizen science. So anybody who was a scuba diver or a snorkeler throughout the world could help to check the health of the reefs. Everybody was an outdoors water person who wanted to protect reefs, right? Where do they hold their, their gala? When, it was already in the books when I got brought on. They had it at an aquarium where we sat 
among all the captured fish from these endangered reefs and ate fish in front of the other fish. Can I just tell you, that wasn't reading their donor base very well. Nobody wanted to get dressed up. No one wanted to see captured fish in an aquarium. And no one wanted to eat farm-raised fish in front of other fish. So. <laughs> You know, let's let's do this. Let's go through the the, the seven steps here, and and okay. I want you to give me one hint, helpful hint in each in every single helpful advice in every section. Okay. So goals define it was number one. You know, define right. your so goals, you, right? Right. So give me one. Five. Yeah. Other. Well, there's right. just five really easy ones. Once raising money, the next is letting the world know that your organization exists because most people don't know your organization's even there. It doesn't matter what kind of an organization. So every time you put out an ad about your event or people talk about your event, it's marketing your organization. An event should be able to tell the guests there what your programs are and what you do because you'd be shocked how many don't have any idea what you do. The next one is to do a call to action, stewardship, to keep the people, the love flowing after the event. And the last goal would be appreciation saying thank you to your donors, supporters, guests, and sponsors. Yeah. So what, what I wanted to do is go back and, and uh, take one of these. Uh, so, you know, the oh, first sorry. thing, you, <laughs> yeah, the first thing that you mentioned was define your goals. So right. just, you know, give me one helpful hint in regards to that topic, because I'm, I'm sure there's many more, but give me one thing. And, uh, you know, like, for example, defining the goals, like one of the things that, you know, I would certainly get somebody from the outside to tell you if your goal is achievable. You know, if you're you if should, you're a yeah. five hundred thousand dollar nonprofit and you want to raise three million dollars at your gala, right? I know we're all optimists, okay? But right. your first gala, and I'll, I, you need somebody to say is yes, you can do that, or no, right. you can't. And I'm I'm right. not a believer and that you shoot for the uh, you know, what, what is the saying? You, you shoot for the stars and you, you know, maybe you'll hit the moon. On the moon. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I don't believe thing. that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think what you need to do is first of all, if you really are starting off and haven't done this before, having someone come in to coach you on goal setting for yeah, this and expectations yeah. is a great investment because what happens is it's not just what you want to raise at the event. It's what can your support base afford? What are you trying to achieve? What are the steps? You, are you trying to fund something? Is this supposed to kick off a capital campaign? Is this a re-engagement strategy? Bring somebody in to help you understand what you're trying to achieve Achieve from that. Sorry, I just had to talk to somebody. Um, so yeah, bring somebody in because it's not just monetary. They'll also help you decide that last goal of how you're going to steward them. They'll help you come up with a plan on what to do after the event to thank everybody. Okay. Now, uh, get the board on board. Get uh, one piece of advice that you would give to our listeners about that. You need to give the board confidence they'll be proud of the event and not embarrassed of it because probably, and let them know it's not going to be hard. They don't need to ask for money. They don't need to get stuff. What they need to do is give you a warm introduction and you follow up with their assets who can be sponsors or make donations, make it easy for them and make them proud. Recruiting a rock star. The committee is the heart and soul because basically they're your marketing machine and your ticket sales machine. So what you do is you see your most loyal volunteers who are hard workers who have resources. I, especially for a gala, these should be people who are well connected with business and who have monetary assets because those are the people that will fill seats at a gala. So you want to recruit loyal volunteers, and then you ask them if they have a friend who wants to join. Because every time you bring a new person in, you're doubling the assets, meaning the connections and the, the money potential from that. So we always look at who's already on board and get their friends, because people like to work with people they know and are friendly with. Attract uh, sponsors. Uh, you have to assess what you have, do a SWOT analysis of what you have to offer, really be creative and dig deep, take one of my sponsorship workshops <laughs> to figure out what you have to offer, create amazing sponsorship materials. So it's put you head and shoulders above everyone else who wants sponsorships, but give them value and prove to them that there's return on their investment because you will send them business. Prove that when, to when them. You, Make the case for support. 
if you've never done an event before, would you say that you need to give yourself a year in advance uh, to put everything together? And that includes working with someone like yourself? I always say it takes nine months to make a baby. It takes nine months to make a gala. Yeah, I was going to say so, seven. Yes. Not, not the baby part, but the, but the nine no, months. No, well, yeah. actually, it's 12 months because usually what I'll do is I have great sponsors. So I'm calling them the week or a few days after the event, sending them those tribute books that we talked about um, that were sitting there. And I'm saying, you know what? We have an even better sponsorship opportunity for you. You might want to consider this year. You don't want to miss it. So let's sign on now. I sign my sponsors on 11 months in advance, often. Okay. Marketing plan. If sponsors want to have confidence in you and your event, they have to know how you'll be marketing their sponsorship and your event in tandem. You need to come up with, you can't say to them, 300 people will see your logo on a digital logo loop during dinner. You can't say that. That's not worth $10,000. But if you say 10,000 loyal supporters will see your logo, sponsorship logo, in the six months leading up to the event during the 10 dedicated email blast where your logo will be a clickable link that has couponing capabilities to drive business to your site. At the event, you will have a tabling opportunity. You will be on the digital loop and post event, we will continue to market. So you have to say, we'll be promoting you for six months, not just two hours at an event. 10,000 pairs of loyal donor eyes. That's because if you have a thousand people on your email list, if you send 10 emails out, that's 10,000 loyal supporters who are seeing their sponsorship. Right okay. there, you've set yourself aside from the people just saying 300 people at our gala will see you. Uh, engagement strategy. So a lot of organizations spend about 100 hours putting together silent auctions that do nothing to promote their organization but zero hours putting together the sequencing of their stage program, that should be reversed. Your silent auction is, a, is entertainment, maybe raises some money, but how you sequence and keep the guest engagement from the very first moment, get rid of every child singing who has nothing to do with your organization. Anybody who's doing a dance recital during your program, any rock band that's a local rock band, get rid of them. They do nothing to but take the focus away from your organization. We have finely honed strategies for keeping, it's all neuroscience. People can only keep attention for so long. You need to engage them and then give them passive engagement. It's all about sequencing your stage program for maximum impact so you open hearts and wallets. Uh, keep momentum going. Last one. Yeah, that's basically, don't, t don't forget to thank Stephen. <laughs> that's in advance because I feel so trivial me, about it, but yeah. No, you are the you are the poster child of what's wrong with organizations post event protocols. Have a post event protocol in place before you even have the event because you're exhausted after the event and there's a million loose ends that need to be done. You need to have an advance. You can pre schedule all the thank you emails. You can pre schedule. You can pre assign which board members are making the phone calls to which donors at which levels that can be done in advance. It all kicks into place on the Monday after your event. And then everything goes like clockwork. I, I don't know if it was you or someone else. I, I, you know, I had to, had this idea and that is, so everyone's like, okay, if I want to bring on, you know, an event coach like yourself, you know, where do I get the money for that? And I'm like, you know, I, I just think that you could go to a, a big donor that's already giving you money and you go to them and say, listen, I want to have an event, but we don't have the expertise inside. And we also don't have the right, I don't have somebody that I can, you know, that can run the event for me internally to can do all the work. Can you make a donation of $40,000 or $50,000? So that I can have this event, and I believe that we can raise three hundred thousand or for whatever it is with that fifty thousand dollar investment. You know, if I was that donor, I'd be like, "Yeah, go do it." Uh, you know, it, most of your donors are business people anyway. You know, right. and they they get investment. You know. And then you're, you know, and then you could say, "Is we could have this event every year. We're going to do it right, right from the very beginning." We're going to build this, we're going to build this, you know, system 
And every year it'll just get easier and easier and it'll really make a big difference. You're right. And so I have it as an underwriting opportunity. So, you know, you can underwrite the valet or underwrite the wine or the after party, underwrite the event producer. It's a great opportunity or a sponsorship. You know, this this event producer was sponsored by your insurance company or whoever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, so you, you're, you're so, spot on with that. So you're saying that you could actually go to the sponsor and say, listen, we want to have this event. And, you know, uh, I was thinking of a donor, but you could just go to the sponsor and say, listen, we want to have this event, but we, you know, I want to do it. You got to be careful. I know how you word this. But you could say, you know, we want to do it right, right from the very beginning. You know, if you make this donation, you know, up front now and you'll get this in return, uh, it allows me to hire somebody to run the event. You right. Know? It's just listed on your sponsorship deck. When you talk about sponsorships and being creative, have the sponsor, have the production person. If you need help with that at the beginning or want to even just put that in as an option, just say, you know, you know, you are our event production sponsor. It's a, it's a 25, 40,000, whatever your event producer is going to be. Then, most of us are not $50,000. I mean, some certainly are, but I mean, I'm not 50,000, so it's much more affordable, but it's certainly a great way to get the help you need and to have somebody underwriter who can feel proud that they know they're putting, putting something meaningful into your event. Yeah. Well, listen, we're going to leave it off at that. That was a really good podcast. And um, I want to thank so very much AJ Steinberg from Queen Bee Fundraising for coming on to today's podcast. And if you like today's podcast, Please feel free to share it with a friend and also subscribe on your favorite podcasting app. And if you like today's podcast, please give us a five-star review. Um, It really helps us get the word out. And of course, if you're looking for a line of credit for your nonprofit, you can call us at 862-207-4118 or visit our website at nonprofitmbapodcast.com. AJ, if anyone gets a hold of you, I know you gave your email out earlier, but if anyone gets a hold of you or getting information, how would they go about doing that? They should go to AJ at queenbeefundraising.com. I answer all my emails. Yep. And your and your website, of course, is queenbeefundraising.com as well. Yeah. Yes, yep. it is. All right. So, uh, you know, I want to thank all our listeners, not just for listening, but also for doing all the heavy lifting, uh, lifting of trying to make the world a better place. Uh, we definitely need you to keep doing what you're doing uh, I know AJ and our and I, in our own little way, are trying to make the world a better place. But you guys are on the front lines, and I thank you for that. I just want to remind you is that just you're no good to anybody. You're no good to your family. You're no good to your employees. You're no good to your cause. You're no good to yourself if you don't. You know, take you come first. So take good care of your health because this is a marathon, not a sprint. So make sure you're thinking about yourself every day and taking good care of yourself. Other than that, uh, uh, thank you for listening to the Nonprofit MBA podcast. It's like our 450th episode. It's been very, very popular and I'm happy to do it. It's a lot of fun. I learn a lot from people like AJ. Have a good day.